He wrote many fine books. This is from a book called The Dignity of Difference. And he says, the fate of the 21st century may turn on whether the world's religions can make a space for those who are not its adherents, who sing a different song, hear different music, tell a different story. So I would just say, as someone who studied, as you heard, sociology, but my first love is really anthropology, um, it's human to sing songs and tell stories. But they're different songs and different stories. And wouldn't the world be a poorer place if it was always the same song and the same story? So, for example, Palestinians and Jews have different narratives. We have to at least be able to listen to the other's narrative. We don't have to agree with it but we have to acknowledge that it's there, recognize that this is the narrative of our neighbors on both sides. The second person I'm gonna quote is a 20th century rabbi called Abraham Yitzchak HaKohen Cook. He had nothing to do with Thomas Cook in Australia. Uh, I think it's only coincidental that they have the same name. And um, some of the followers of Rav Kook today in Israel are people that I find very problematic, or at least their ideas. But this particular quotation, I think, really epitomizes what I'm talking about. And Rav Kook said, some err, E-R-R, they make a mistake, and think that world peace can be built only through total consensus. But the truth is that real peace, on the contrary, can come to the world only through precisely the multiplicity of peace. And this is when all sides and opinions come to light and are proven to each have their own place. In other words, it's through diversity of opinion that truth and peace come to light. Now, having said that, I do want to make two salient points. First of all, I think that in all of our religious traditions, there are some elements, that could be stories, songs, role models, parables, verses, traditions, practices, customs, whatever, that promote a positive, compassionate, loving relationship with the other. I also think that in all of our traditions, we have the opposite. We have some very problematic texts. We have verses that at least on the surface seem to be calling for revenge, violence, all kinds of things. So, Recognizing that we all have both of those, I believe we must strive to emphasize within each of our cultures, and this is work that I think Jews have to do on Jewish tradition, Christians on Christian tradition, Muslim on Muslim. I've been in groups where Hindus are doing it on Hindu tradition, etc. Those elements that do promote the more open and compassionate attitude, but I believe that all of our religious traditions have resources that can form a more peaceful approach. As a matter of fact, there are two American rabbis who in the past year have published books on looking for resources for peace within the Jewish tradition. Um, Sheldon Lewis, I think is the first one. The other one is a good friend of mine, Amy Eilberg, first woman to be ordained by the conservative movement back in the 80s. So here are two Rabbis in North America, both in the same year, both publishing the kind of books that I'm interested in, in encouraging. Secondly, sometimes it is precisely when people feel that their own identity is under attack that they respond violently. And I'll bring a quotation now from another source, uh, American Jewish philosopher Michael Walzer, 
who said, when my parochialism is threatened, then I am holy, and here it's holy with a W, W-H-O-L-L-Y, okay? Sometimes we're talking about the other kind of holy, but he says, I am holy, radically parochial, and nothing else. Under conditions of security, I will acquire a more complex identity than the idea of tribalism suggests. Our goal then, I believe, should not be the eradication of group identities, but their empowerment through ensuring the safety and security of the different groups. And in this important task, interreligious dialogue can develop a grassroots climate more conducive to peace. Now, I want to bring a reference from the Bible, but the uh, commentary that I'm bringing on the Bible is from a very radical Jewish uh, couple. They're both rabbis, the husband and wife. And uh, up till now, I, I told you I've quoted two Orthodox rabbis. The two books are written by two conservative rabbis. And now I'm bringing, I don't know if they're considered <coughs> progressive or reform. Or, actually, I do know they're, they're renewal. I think there's a Jewish renewal movement. Um, and I'm talking about Rabbi Arthur Waskow and his wife, Rabbi Phyllis Berman. Am I correct that they're renewal rabbis? Okay, good. So this is probably, you know, sort of like way over on the left from uh, the Orthodox within the Jewish community. And they are both religious and political radicals who have worked closely with um, Christian and Muslim activists. If any of you know Sister Joan Chittister, who's a, a Benedictine nun, they've worked quite closely with her. In any case, they wrote a book called Freedom Journeys, The Tale of Exodus and Wilderness Across Millennia. It's a kind of a commentary on the story of Exodus. And there, they offer a modern midrash, a kind of uh, rabbinic commentary, on an important scene in the book of Joshua. And I have to tell you, it's not my favorite book in the Bible. You know, if I were one of the rabbis in the second century who, I believe, canonized what Christians call the Old Testament, what we call the Tanakh, or the Mikra, I think I would not have voted for Joshua to be in the canon, but it's there. Okay, so we have to deal with it. So in the Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 and 14, having crossed the Jordan River, Joshua meets a man who has his sword drawn. And Joshua asks, are you for us or for our enemies? And the first word that comes out of the man's mouth in the Hebrew Bible is the word Lo. And here I have to say Hebrew and Israeli have the same word, right? The word means no. So according to the Waskow Berman commentary, it says, we hear it to mean this no. I'm not, I'm not here to support either one of you in your war against each other nor do I support the conflict itself. Which I, I happen to love that commentary. And that brings me now to the uh, gist of what I want to say, and as I told you, I'm going to be very brief. I think the worst thing we can do when it comes to Israel and Palestine is to present the conflict as a zero-sum game of either or. And I guess not up there anymore, but if you're a friend of Israel, can you also be a friend of Palestine and vice versa? Okay? Um, uh, uh, to me, the answer here is not law, but can. Yes. You certainly can be, I believe. Today, both Israelis and Palestinians see themselves as the victims of the conflict. 
And we sometimes engage in a competition as to who has suffered more. And I think this phrase is original with me. I call it the suffering sweepstakes. You know, there's some kind of a contest to be a greater victim. One of the problems with victimhood is that it prevents the victim from assuming responsibility for her or his actions, including the victimization of others. And in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, I believe that both sides are victims and both sides are victimizers. And I don't believe that if you're pro-Palestinian, you must be anti-Israeli, or if you're pro-Israel, you must be anti-Palestinian. I like to think that we can be both pro-Palestinian and pro-Israeli, because we're pro-people, and therefore pro-peace. The achievement of peace, I believe, necessitates a two-state solution as I said earlier, based on some recognition of the two narratives. And personally, I define myself as a Zionist, and I believe that the best fulfillment of Zionism will come when there is a Palestinian state alongside the state of Israel. Now, I want to tell you a joke, because up till now it's been kind of serious. <laughs> the joke says, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. <laughs> but as in many jokes, there's an element of truth. In other words, I think that modern day Jews, especially since the Holocaust, are like paranoiacs who have real enemies. We have real enemies. There is anti-Semitism in the world and it's rearing its ugly head in a lot of places. But we have to be able to distinguish our real enemies from our friends or potential friends, or at least, you know, you could be neither an enemy nor a friend. In fact, I believe that most people in the world are probably so preoccupied with their own problems that they don't even think about us. So they're not enemies and they're not friends. The rabbinic tradition says, who is a true hero? Someone who turns his enemy into his friend. And I think that for peace to really take hold, there's going to have to be a lot of healing and reconciliation. And this work can be done by educators, by religious leaders, by mental health professionals, etc., where both sides have to cope with their own painful memories and get over whatever paranoia might still be lurking within their psyche. And some of this work is going on. And I'm happy to tell you that throughout everything, the wars and the intifada and so on and so forth, there are mental health professionals on both sides who meet and deal a man from our synagogue who developed the Jerusalem Trauma Center, who's a psychologist and who works with Palestinian psychologists. There's a phenomenon of bedwetting on both sides, among children, obviously, pretty much. So we can learn from each other's experience. We can help each other. We have to do much, much more of that. Now, I'm going to reach my conclusion and Please forgive me, but I did write it. So part of this I've said uh, extemporaneously, and part of it I've written. I, as you heard, I moved to Israel some 42 years ago. Um, I wish I could say I was only five years old at the time, but I wasn't. I was an adult, and I've lived the vast majority of my adult life in Jerusalem. But having grown up in the 1960s in America, I was taught that if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And I came to Israel to be part of the solution. The state of Israel, in my opinion, 
is the greatest collective enterprise, some might even call it adventure, certainly project, of the Jewish people in modern times, possibly since the building of the Second Temple. I don't want to be too extravagant, but it's the major project in modern times. It is deeply flawed. Some of the imperfections reflect the many competing and conflicting ideological visions within the Zionist movement and the impossibility of fulfilling them all. In other words, if some people think it should be a religious state and some people feel it should be a secular state and some people want it to be liberal and some people want it to be socialist and some people want it to be capitalism, so obviously we're not going to be able to be all things to all people. Some of the flaws reflect the trauma of the Holocaust, the Shoah, and the continuing security nightmare in our region. And I can't say that things are getting better when I look at Syria, and when I look at Egypt, and some other neighboring countries. This nightmare is continuing. Some of the flaws reflect the demographics of who came to live in the new state generally people without strong traditions of democratic government. And thank God we still have a democratic country. It's imperfect, but I just heard today, and forgive me, I love Australia. This is my first time in Adelaide, but it's my seventh time in Australia. That's a long trip. So I wouldn't have made the trip seven times if I didn't love it here, okay? But I heard from Michael, that the Australian Constitution doesn't yet include the indigenous people in rights. Okay, so you're also a flawed democracy. As far as I know, there is no perfect democracy. We can always strive to be better. We shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't be complacent and say, well, it's good enough. But the fact that it's flawed doesn't mean it's not a democracy. So thank God we're still a democracy. Some flaws can be characterized as mistakes human errors, some, I would suggest, are sinful. And when we open up for questions, I'm not going to defend everything that the State of Israel has done. I can't really defend the present government because I didn't vote for them. The party I voted for is in the opposition. So I don't feel a responsibility to defend everything. But as Jews, and Christians, we believe in the power of transformation and renewal. Christians often use the term metanoia in Greek for transformation. Jews sometimes call it teshuva, renewal, return. Sin in Hebrew is literally missing the mark. Chet, takta'a. It's not a human birth defect, nor a condition that can never be changed. It is the consequence of poor choices, many of which can be reversed. The modern word for crisis, mashber, has biblical roots in the book of Isaiah, where it means a birthing stool, or the position one assumes to give birth. We are living in a time of crisis, but we may be able to transform it into a time of birth, birth of a better society and a better world. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to open the floor up to questions uh, and comments. Please keep them short. Um, we know that this is a, a difficult issue to deal with. We know the pain that it causes on both sides. We perhaps don't, we need to have some of that underlined at the same time as we need to engage in a dialogue which isn't just um, an expression of pain. If you have a... Uh, no, we'll need to use your microphone. 
for oh, sorry. Of course. Because it is being recorded to your house. Yes, well I suppose we should be going <laughs>